Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists webinar series. We are so glad you could join us today. My name is Sergio Salinas, and I am pleased to be the moderator for today's webinar. We are excited to share an SWS e-learning experience during a time when many of us are looking for virtual opportunities to stay engaged and gain some continuing education credits. This webinar is one way to stay connected to the wetland community during the global pandemic, and we hope everyone is well. Today's lecture and topic will be karst wetlands in the Yucatan Peninsula. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Eduardo Seguro Espinosa. Eduardo Seguro is a biologist graduated from the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico. He completed graduate studies in environmental biotechnology and earth sciences. He is currently appointed to the Water Sciences Unit in the, of the Yucatan Center for Scientific Research in the city of Cancun. He is interested in the study of biochemical cycles and wetlands. He has conducted research on the nitrogen cycle in surface and groundwater, nutrients in coastal wetlands, distribution and fate of agrochemicals, and the impact of waste water, of waste water of the, on the environment. As part of the research and teaching activities, he is interested in communicating the results to a specialized and non-specialized public so that the information generated is used to decision making as tools through links with industry and the government. So, Eduardo, be our guest. The mic is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for the opportunity of presenting today uh, to all of you. Uh, this of this, I hope that I can convey this information in a proper manner. And uh, I hope that um, some of you will learn a bit about this corner of the world and find it interesting. Interested, sorry. Uh, next, please. So let me start just mentioning what is uh, the CC. Uh, CC stands for the Yucatan Center for Scientific Research. Um, we are part of the um, National, National Science and Technology Council. So in, in a way, we are the research scientists of the federal government. Our main uh, activities are basically uh, developed research. Um, we have grad, uh, grad studies programs to generate high skilled human resources. We also do outreach. We tra uh, transfer technology. And our mission is to promote the development of the society in harmony with the environment. So in this corner of the country is where we conduct various research, particularly, particularly about water science, uh, hydrogeology, water chemistry, uh, ecology, and what I'm presenting today. Next, please. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar, we're going to start with some leveling concepts. Despite the straightforward definition of karst, this can be a very diverse concept. It has a large intrinsic uh, diversity by regions and by even uses or names. The karstification process and the morphologies associated with it are relatively well known. However, most of the current knowledge has been developed in temperate regions. Much less is known and even published about tropical karst. Microclimate and microbiology has been relatively out of mind, focusing namely on the physical chemical processes developing the karstification. Nonetheless, almost all of us are somehow familiar with a karsting landscape. Next, please. So karst, karst wetlands should not be linked to places only with karstic features without understanding the intertwined relationships between uh, surface and subsurface, groundwater and surface water. According to Beltram, wetlands and karst share not only water, but also the whole hydrological system of the catchment area. Both are locally and regionally associated to the hydrological cycle as water passes into, is stored, within uh, it flows through and emerges or discharge in different locations. The quality and quantity of water in combination with other factors are crucial for maintaining the form and the structure of, and ecological characters of these wetlands. 
Next, please. Now let's take the next step, the tectocarst wetlands. These are geomorphological features and landscapes caused by the dissolution of rocks, namely limestone, dolomite, halite, and gypsum, under the influence of tectonic alteration. So it's a combination of these two main processes. This facilitate the local and regional water movement together with dissolved substances. These alterations commonly are faults or fractures, which together with the karstification process generates this landscape where there is a large hydraulic network below the surface. The Yucatan Peninsula is a young tropical karst system, uh, even being young is well developed. Its relevance and importance spans different disciplines such as paleoclimatology, geography, geomorphology, hydrogeology, geochemistry, ecology, and undeniably the relevance for the establishment and flourishment of several social groups from ancient Mayas to current day urban areas, such as an important uh, touristic area as Cancun. Next, please. So now that we have standardized some terms, the rest of the talk, I will be uh, presenting some of the knowledge we have regarding the tectocarstic wetlands in the Yucatan Peninsula. It is not by all means an extensive um, review and it, it doesn't follow a, an order in time. Uh, we have divided this presentation in general categories, uh, geographic and or geomorphological studies, botanical or ecological approaches, uh, geochemistry or biogeochemistry studies. And I will close with some of the examples of the current research undertaken in CC in collaboration with other colleagues from several institutions, government agencies and other organizations. You might notice jumps in times because it's not chronolo chronologically organized. Next, please. First, from the geographical and geomorphological point of view, wetlands in this area in the, of the country uh, were named floodable lowlands or flood prone lowlands before they were, they were even named wetlands. The focus of those efforts was in recognizing the correspondence between landscape and vegetation. Yet, all of this, all of these with a geographical, appro geographical approach. Uh, this particular paper highlights that these wetlands were not restricted to the cumulative plains established on, on glaciers. These landscapes are, uh, all these landscapes are closely linked and correlated to the adjacent ecosystems with different geoforms, confirming nothing more than the continuum commonly stressed by wetland scientists. These landscape units, units function as an atypical endorheic basin where infiltration and dissolution are closely linked. And they conclude that these landscape units have unique environmental conditions, uh, not expected in all, to be presented in all, in all karstic areas. It has an invaluable ecological importance and different functional perspective and are relevant and is relevant as a unique landscape. Next, please. Uh, at a larger scale, considering in this case the state of Quintana Roo, colleagues, for, colleagues from the University of the Quintana Roo created a map of karstic depressions in order to classify the three main features, sinkholes, uvulas, and polges. They use uh, criteria such as area, shape, compactness index. And in the state of Quintana Roo, they have reported that 59% of these features are uvalas, 35% are sinkholes, and only 6% 6 of the, the, these depressions are polges. However, being larger, uh, surface area is dominated by polges, despite the low number. And Sinkholes are very abundant, but very, they are representative of a very small area. Um, they also relate the features with flood. Uh, extraordinary flood regime is the most frequent, followed by permanent flood regime uh, in sinkholes and uvalas and temporary flood in polis. Another important finding is that 81% of the depressions are found below 50 meters above sea level and then, then their number and area decrease as the height increase. 
in such manner that above 170 meters above sea level, there's only 4% of these features found. So basically, it's associated with lowlands. Next, please. Now, regarding soil studies, uh, this paper remarks uh, that we have limited information available about the soil genesis in tropical wetlands. Large parts of the terrestrial ecosystems in the Yucatan Peninsula are dominated by leptosoils, which are generally thin soils with elevated content of calcium as a result of the parent material, material the rock. Inside the wetlands, at a micro scale, we found other types of soils. And opposite to the idea that these soils were generally organic or glake, the dominant unit in these soils, in these wetlands, is calcium. Apparently, a fair share of this soil was biogenically created, synthesized by algae from periodic flooding of groundwater with elevated carbonates and biogenically deposited. One of the most interesting findings is the sequence of horizons alternatively enriched with organic matter or with carbonates reflecting the duration and, and alter, al, al, the duration and combination of flooding and dry periods. Next, please. Now, turning the page to botanical and ecological studies, the earliest document that we can track regarding karst karstic wetlands in the peninsula was presented in the chapter Wetlands of Mexico by Ingrid Olmsted in 1983. Due to the lack of a classification system at that time, Olmsted retorted in the US classification to give some order, and yet she referred to local names, which basically are now recorded for posterity. It's what we still use. As such, she described the peninsula as a large plain with an elevation no, no higher than 300 meters above sea level, no superficial flow, and high permeable sedimentary rock. Seagrasses prairies are, are barely mentioned. Um, and when they're mentioned, they are dominated by Thalassia, Alodule, uh, and Siringonium. Mangroves are much better described with a special mention to the scrub shop uh, scrub shrub mangroves are uh, particularly abundant in Siankan. Uh, she also um, focused some attention in the petenes or hammocks, um, which is a common feature in this area. For those who are not familiar with the term peten, it's a forested island commonly with mangrove and other species of uh, freshwater tolerance, with, uh, uh, such as manilcara or metopium or ficus. And these isolated wetlands are commonly established on organic soil on top of rock. They also, they always have freshwater inputs from groundwater discharges. The next unit she mentioned were uh, brackish and freshwater marshes. They, they have a patchy organization and they occur mostly on marl with a thin organic layer adjacent to mangroves and bottomwood. The dominant species of marshes reported were Tifa, Phragmitis, Gladium, Eleocaris, and Rhynchospora. For the forested wetlands, the units mentioned are Mukal, a shrub scrub wetland dominated by Dalbergia. Uh, she also mentioned the palm thickets, uh, and this unit is locally named Tasistal, and is dominated by, by palms such as Acelorapid rhyde. The low inundated forest, which includes Tintales, is uh, dominated by Ematoxylum campechano. So as you can see, the units were usually associated with the dominant species, and then they received that name. Next, please. There is a very interesting work about the herbaceous wetlands, uh, studying several marshes from mesohaline to completely fresh water in different water types from sulfate chloride water to calcic carbonate water. These uh, wetlands generally are low, have low nutrients, uh, but high nitrogen accumulated in sediments. One of the most important outcomes of this paper was that biomass production and decomposition are functions of, of individual plant growth. So basically associate, associated to the species, uh, but with some environmental conditions, some influence from the environmental conditions. 
The decomposition for TIFA and Eleocaris is relatively fast within the range of 200 days. Uh, but Cladium, Cladium hamaicensis, has a slow decomposition rate. Only half of the tissue decomposed after 600 days. Uh, the formation of uh, the pit layer in these wetlands was enhanced after the establishment, the establishment of, of these herbaceous species. There were also preferences in substrate. Some plants established on peaty clays and uh, some other species uh, prefer clay soils or alluvial sands. Next, please. Um, some valuable papers have been published in Spanish, uh, but likely they do not reach a large audience, audience outside of Mexico. Yet there are very important ecological information that has been produced. For instance, this paper by Albor Pinto et al. Uh, collaborators in 2017, uh, it tackles the vegetal diversity and structure in temporarily flooded uh, forests. They use a floristic similarity analysis with, uh, analysis with species reported in 11 locations within flores, uh, flooded forests in Yucatan, Quintana Roo, Campeche, the three states comprising the peninsula, and a very a neighborhood uh, state, uh, Tabasco, which is not a strictly a karst uh, area. They found that the three states of the peninsula have a different composition, a floristic composition, compared with the adjacent floristic units in Tabasco. The wood flora showed uh, neotropical affinities uh, with sites in Central America and Brazil, and the community structure suggested optimal conservation status. An elevated biomass of a species, uh, such as the, the tree species, the Matoxilum campechanum, and high abundance of Dalbergia glabra. Next, please. Uh, recently, uh, a note from a colleague from CC mentioned the need of understanding a, particularly, a particular vegetation assemblage in coastal wetlands. Uh, he called it Calichal, uh, but the most appropriate term will be Coquina, because this is a, a coastal unit. This landscape is established on recrystallized carbonates with a high number of mollusk conchs and comprise a mosaic with various vegetal associations such as low deciduous forest, cacti, candelabri forms, herbs, shrubs, and open areas without vegetation. What makes especially interesting these environments is the geomorphological settlement, which interacts with groundwater and occasion occasionally with seawater. These conditions are essential to explain the presence of this type of vegetation, frequently connected with estuaries, with mangrove forest, and other herbaceous wetlands. Next, please. Um, there is continued research relative to the vegetation and floristics, and perhaps is the most abundant literature regarding wetlands in this area. Um, they either revisit the floodable lowlands or increase the knowledge of savannas, which are herbaceous wetlands, commonly in sites like karst karstic depressions or fractures, as you can see in the photo. The work by, uh, developed in Bridgewater, by Bridgewater in the frontier between Mexico and Belize states that the range and diversity and variety of savannas is part of an ecotone. These areas um, usually are within an ecological succession um, um, transect, not necessarily considered a stable community because uh, in they, um, flood varies. After a detailed vegetation description, they concluded that savannas, which are these herbaceous wetlands, are frequently in poor conservation status. And sadly, it's very likely that happens the same in Mexico. Next, please. So let's move now to another topic, uh, biogeochemistry in these wetlands. As almost other wetland systems, these landscapes are hotspots for carbon sequestration. The work by Adame and collaborators in sinkhole wetlands reported one of the greatest soil organic carbon mass reported in wetlands, despite the small area they represent. They estimated between 400 and 2,800 megagrams of carbon per hectare, assumed to be primarily driven by sea level fluctuations after the last glacial minimum, which started over 3,000 years ago. 
This results in highly preserved mangrove roots and all the decaying organic matter that has changed little since its deposition. These wetlands should be considered tropical peatlands as this layer reached between one and as deep as five meters below ground. Approximately 38% of the soil is carbon. Next, please. So previous flow models, uh, the local knowledge of the communities and common sense suggested that water flows from south to north in this fracture control valley named uh, Holbosch, Holbosch Fracture System. It is a large landscape unit dominated by herbaceous wetlands. And in 2020, a group of colleagues from NIU and CC uh, used strontium isotopes and ion geochemistry to demonstrate that water effectively flows north within the fracture system. They suggest the existence of um, at least two flow paths, one in the east and one of the west. And basically, they are controlled by the, these are the boundaries of the, of the fracture zone. They also found differences in water chemistry in each of the flow paths um, with greater magnesium contribution in the eastern boundary, assumed to be uh, because uh, the, the rock there, it's dolomite. And we uh, confirmed that finding with more re recent work that, that I will show you in a, minute, in a few minutes. They also mentioned that water moves through these zones. Um, it, it's um, facilitated flow due to these various um, flow paths. The water is moving fast. So the, the water rock interaction in some point is reduced. And as most of us dealing with the hydrologic, the hydrogeology of this area, they highlight the need of determining the divide in these various flow paths. So we can distinguish when, when the flow is south north and when it's in the other directions. Hydro, hydrologically, they provided evidence that the fracture zone encompass area be areas beyond the, the, the visible savannas. So these wetlands are provided with ecological flow. Uh, basically, with, uh, with the water moving in these uh, facilitated flow paths. Next, please. I would like to take a few moments to make a special mention uh, regarding ecological studies. The ecological reserve or uh, name was founded in 1993, and it was the first private ecological reserve in Mexico, what we call now voluntarily dedicated conservation areas. This reserve was conceived as a space to develop a new model of research, conservation, management, and restoration. The emblematic projects at, at the Leden were focused on uh, jaguar and crocodile, mainly ecology and conservation, using those species as umbrella species for protection and restoration of the whole ecosystem. However, in this area, there have been several studies of uh, plant biodiversity, epiphytes, fungi, birds, diatoms, nematodes, insects, gastropods, bats, and even deer. There, there are also studies on restoration, carbon and nitrogen cycling, among other, others. In case you're interested, the website stores most of the uh, available documents. Next, please. So now that we have made this brief review, I will mention some of the research that we have, we have conducted in tectocarst wetlands in this, this area. Next, please. Um, this first study was completed as part of a project with the National Commission of Protected Areas in Mexico, in which we investigated the condition of the lake and we found very interesting things. It's not that karstic lakes are not a study, rather they are not studied with this perspective. They have been studied for paleo paleoclimatic, uh, paleoclimatic reconstruction. We found that it's basically three, probably three sinkholes, uh, which are now united by the whole lake. Uh, it's an, an, an oligotrophic lake. Still, we can see low anthropogenic influence, but there is some influence now in the touristic area. Uh, the water type is mixed, uh, chloride, calcium, magnesium. And the most interesting thing is that we found hydrochemical evolution in a period of 20 years which we think is a short period. Uh, this uh, evolution was based on ion exchange of, wa of water with the solid phase. 
the rock and so probably some clays, intensive evaporation and sulfate reduction. We don't have evidence of saline intrusion. The, the deepest part of the lake is 26 meters. And um, it also highlights the, the importance and the relevance of water storage unit. It stores more than 5 million of cubic meters of water. Next, please. Uh, the following example depicts the study we did on urban sinkholes. We call them sinkhole wetlands as they are located inside dolines, but they have developed all the char characteristics of wetlands. We have evidence, we found evidence of organic mineral mineralization and nitrogen cycle, a uh, very high um, water retention capacity in the soil uh, with elevated calcium. We expected that, but we, did, we, were, we weren't sure that there was so much uh, sil uh, silicon, and we found it uh, in elevated concentration. Uh, the tree biomass was variable, where from 0 0.01 to 0 0.3 kilograms of carbon per tree. They are established in an ovoid to round shapes with flow tolerant trees, um, unconsolidated substrate. And according to our classification system in Mexico, it's a palustrine system, uh, a subsystem depression, and the class is from seasonal to intermittent to flood. Next, please. Uh, we have given steps toward the, towards the understanding of savanna wetlands. Uh, these large herbaceous wetlands located at the Holbosch Fracture Zone. We made a study to have the basic knowledge of the system. As you can see, or you can see in the example, uh, we are not an ecological group, so there's a weakness regarding the systematic of vegetations. But we, what we found is that there's evidence of denitrification. Um, we didn't have the isotope data for the publication at that time, but now we have it now. Uh, we found low phosphorus, uh, which is basically related to precipitation or bound. Uh, it's all bound to calcium, iron, or aluminum in the sediment. And we are in the, in the process of proving that. Um, we, we previously Assume, but now we know for sure that this is a free autotrophic wetland. It's a recharge point, a recharge zone, but it's also a, a, a discharge area. So we have water, precipitation water coming into the aquifer and groundwater coming out to the surface. There's also intense evaporation because it's, a, it's completely exposed to the sun. There's water rock interaction um, and well, recharge, as I mentioned before. Um, the anaerobic conditions of the soil and, uh, and the water creates elevated alkalinity and sulfur and, um, enhanced sulfur reduction. And we also were able to provide numbers on water storage as a, a step uh, moving into eco ecosystemic services of this area. So they, it, it stores a large amount of water, not only in the surface after the hurricanes, delta and zeta, but also in the soil. We estimated that only in the 50 centimeters of the topsoil with an average density of 0.25 grams per cubic meter, uh, cubic centimeter, sorry, uh, there was almost a half a million of cubic meters of water stored in the soil. Next, please. The momentum we have created studying this small area of the peninsula is being nurtured by grad students who decided to do their master thesis in these wetlands. Generated, generating the baseline knowledge so we can have a better gra grasp of these ecosystems. In this slide, we can see on the left Pedro and on the right is Wendy. Pedro is ready to defend his master thesis and his uh, research considered four wetlands that you can see in the map from letter um, H1 to H4 in the whole Bosch complex uh, wetlands. He will have an inventory of nitrogen and phosphorus existing in water, dissolved, and soil and in roots of one dominant species, which is Gladium hamaicensis. Uh, looking at its relationship with the hydrochemistry of the wetlands located in different parts of, different parts of the fracture zone. So far, he has information that suggests that the hydrochemistry doesn't have any ap apparent influence on nitrogen and phosphorus accumulation in the plants, 
the major findings that, that he has is the, the high amount of nitrogen was found in the soil as uh, it wasn't a surprise, but the surprise is that we expected much phosphorus in the soil than in, in, the, in plants, and it was the opposite. Much more phosphorus was found in the roots than in the soil. Wendy is now taking the relay baton and she will make a sort of a screening of macro and micro elements as a stepping stone uh, for moving into the study of biogeochemical cycles. We want to know which elements are there and where they are. Next, please. This last example is uh, relative to a, to a research less focused on the wetland itself, uh, but more looking into the environmental assessment of wetlands due to metal contamination in a natural protected area in Cancun, surrounded, completely surrounded by the urban area. We might consider this study as a variation of coastal squeeze, but in this case, the wetland has been isolated from the, the companion wetlands, which is spans to the north and to the coast. Uh, but fortunately, it still has hydrological connectivity with the sea and with the aquifer. In this research, which was conducted by Dino in the left uh, photo during his master thesis, we found that water and plankton uh, didn't have any concentration of metals above 20 micrograms per liter, which was our, our experimental detection limit. Um, so in water and plankton, the ecological risk is low. However, the sediments did have a quantifiable uh, metal concentration. I'll wait a minute, thank you. Um, so there's the, the metals we found in sediment and sediments were aluminum and zinc. And these, uh, these elements, they, they actually pose a risk to the natural protected area. And this is particularly relevant because this city doesn't have any conventional industry. It's a young city. And all the contamination that we can found there has been generated in only 50 years due to the urbanization and the touristic industry. This research has already been published. Uh, so in the metal, including metals accumulated and translocated in plants and fecal coliforms detected in the lagoon. Next, please. In this last slide, I would like to talk about how we transfer the knowledge to other people especially those living in, in these areas. In the first example on the left, the data we collected and analyzed in the lab regarding the sinkhole wetlands, uh, it was represented in a traffic-like manner in a report card. A total of 13 sites administered by the local government, the municipality, were sampled, and we produced a report of the condition status of each of the sites in terms of trophic state, the metals in sediments, and so plankton biodiversity. This way we can inform the people about the environment without the burden of interpreting numbers. On the second example, we prepared a brief text about the major findings in the wetland La Esperanza and requested its, its, its translation to Maya, the spoken language in the area. Probably we tell the people something that they already knew or suspected, but now they have the power of the information for their purposes either preparing proposals for projects or arguing in favor of the conservation of the weather. Next, please. So I have now reached the end of my journey with you and I would like to conclude with these key points. Uh, the herbaceous wetlands in the Yucatan Peninsula are yet to be known. We are giving the steps in that direction. Uh, being groundwater dependent ecosystems, the water chemistry might be relevant for the establishment and the conservation and the ecology of these wetlands. We need to transfer the knowledge to the people and the government. Is not, we, we don't want to, to keep the research uh, collecting dust in a shell. And the Yucatan Peninsula have water of adequate quality and quantity in the place and at the time that is needed, thanks to the wetlands. And I think this is very relevant in face, uh, facing all the water shortage we have everywhere in the world. Next, please. And with that, I finish. I want to thank uh, particularly my three more closest colleagues, Daniela Ortega, Mariana Bravo, and Gilberto Acosta, doing the research uh, in these wetlands. 
um, all the students, as I mentioned, Pedro and Wendy, but we also have so, um, some other students that keep running the lab, all the research group uh, water security in socio environmental systems, which are depicted in the right hand side of the slide, and all the personnel and colleagues at CC, uh, the, water, the water science unit. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Eduardo, for that very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Let's get to the Q&A section. Again, I will be posing your questions, and maybe there will be a few of my own that I have received through the Q&A bottom to the presenter. The most popular questions have, uh, that have been upvoted to the top of the uh, will be read first. And if you forget to ask a question or have to leave before the Q and the Q and A section, uh, you can email that presented to the email address listed on this slide. So let's get started. Uh, there is there are a few questions already. I will start for the very first one that was made a few minutes ago. So Eduardo, there is an anonymous attendee that asked. Was the flow you monitor through phase flow due to the higher and low tide? The flow we monitor. Um, I hope I answered the, the properly. Um, if it refers to the flow in the in the sinkhole wetlands, um, it's um, we don't have any tide influence. It is the same for the savannas for the herbaceous wetlands. All of the examples I presented, particularly mentioning the research at CC, are not coastal. Only the last example is coastal, the one with the risk assessment. And in that case, that lagoon doesn't have a direct contact with the sea. Uh, it's the south, the southern end of the of a lake, a, a lagoon complex. So the connection is um, northwards. So we don't have any flow measurement directly related to tide. Okay. There is another one. Do you have any plans or strategies for transferring the information to people and government? Well, we, the first steps we have given is what I presented just briefly. Uh, I have a, a much more elaborate strategy thanks to the outreach department in CC. So um, it's a, a three-step um, uh, strategy. First of all, we want to go back and ask people questions, what exactly they want to know about the wetlands, because probably the questions we're answering is not the questions they have or the information they requested. Then with that information, we can produce small um, um, posters or um, um, information that we can provide and leave fixed somewhere when they can read it. Uh, the, the central store, um, the, the water well, uh, a church, uh, an office. And well, that's uh, the third step will be impacting a larger audience, which is finding a space in radio, the local station, and finding a space with authorities, requesting for being participants of their um, the local meetings that they have to help. That's a, that, that's pretty much the strategy we want to, to tackle. Thanks, thanks again, Eduardo. There is another question by Diane Hall. What will be the impact of the new train system being constructed in this area? Has the government used your information to inform the route of the new train system? Well, particularly about this, the, the examples I provided, um, the train, the, the, the trail, the, the road, I, I forget the word, the train will go, will pass south of this um, large complex, uh, but we don't know the impact in terms of the water flow. That's uh, so I cannot provide a, a good answer about it. Um, in other areas, probably the, the rail roads 
will have a larger impact, but that will be southern of the examples and the wetlands that I have more information, so I, I cannot provide an accurate uh, answer. In terms of the, the use of this information, uh, we have we, ha we are lucky to have some ears of some governmental agencies, but not all. And sadly, um, the, the train is developed at a federal level where we cannot, we haven't found the proper ways to reach the people, the appropriate people to have that information. Uh, there's plenty of information about the flooded uh, caves and all the, what, what it's called subterrane rivers, which is basically the, the free aquifer in the South area. That information has been provided, but hasn't had the impact that we have expected in terms of uh, decision-making. Okay, thanks. There, there, there is another one. Uh, so I think it's related with the first question yes. that, that I asked. So how or why were the flows in different directions with different compositions? Were the stream flows at different elevations within the wetlands? I get it. Uh, yeah, they refer to the, to the example I talk about uh, preferential flow in the whole bush fracture system. Uh, well, first of all, it's not a stream. We don't have uh, surface water running in this area. It's the elevation of the water table. Uh, or the water, the groundwater moving north to south. So it's not that different directions in terms of uh, east to west. Uh, the fracture system creates uh, a conduit for preferential flow. So we don't know exactly where the divide is, uh, where water goes either in one direction to the fracture zone or the other direction to the coastal zone. That's that we don't know. Uh, but in this area, the, the whole Bosch fracture zone, it, uh, it, I would like to say all, but preferentially all, most, gro most groundwater flows south to north. Okay, thanks Eduardo. Uh, I will give a minute uh, for more people to type down in the Q&A box more questions, but in the meanwhile, I have one. So from my own. So I know you have been involved in the uh, wetlands atlas of the Saudito of Mexico. And uh, I would like you to, to elaborate to our audience about this work. What is, what is the aim of this work? How is it going? What you can tell us about lessons learned, particularly for tecto uh, karst wetlands in the peninsula. So please. Yes, uh, this project is a, a large effort from several institutions, at least seven, uh, well, probably more than that, and it includes seven states. So it's a, a regional effort, and we have to divide the, the, the areas because of the distance and the, the workload it means. Um, one of the main, well, the main object is to have um, proper, properly delineated the limits of the wetlands. Uh, currently, what we have in terms of C, uh, his, uh, GIS or cartography uh, has either the wetlands that we can see because of the water that is exposed or based on assumptions about the, the plants, but we don't know actually the boundaries. So that's one of the main aims, the proper delimitation of the wetlands, including any of the three um, criteria, uh, dominant um, soil, hydromorphic, hydro, um, Hydro, hydromorphic soil, um, plants which tolerate flood or water itself. So in terms, that, that's the general approach of this uh, atlas. Uh, it's focusing on large complexes. We, um, we unfortunately are missing the small, air, the small wetlands, uh, but in such an effort, we have to, to, to give priority to the, to the large big complexes. And what, we, what I have found, particularly in Quintana Roo, is that we have enough information. I, I, I won't say plenty, but we have enough information about mangroves and coastal wetlands. But we have much less, very little information on inland wetlands, particularly forested flooded wetlands and herbaceous wetlands. 
And that's what I am trying to focus my, my efforts in herbaceous wetlands that we have very few information. And um, we, um, as, as the common place says, we, don't, we cannot perceive what we don't understand. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Eduardo. There is one question by Chris Maiden. Can you comment on the impact of agriculture and cattle industries on water quality of groundwater that is discharged far from the sources at the coastal margins? Well, I can comment as much as I, I have read. Um, there is, what we do know is that there's impact from uh, uh, agricultural and, uh, and cattle activities. That, that we know for sure. We have, we have found the impact and the traces of those impacts in groundwater in several places, almost everywhere in the peninsula. Now, regarding how this water moves to the coastal area, there, are been so, there have been some efforts and some studies specifically focusing on, on submerged uh, groundwater discharge. Uh, one of the main difficulties of those studies is that the water, at the, at the time we can grab that water sample, is highly diluted. Uh, so finding the proper place to grab the sample that represents accurately the groundwater discharge has been um, um, complicated. There are very few examples of that, um, but th there's evidence that there, all the solutes moving in the groundwater reaches uh, the coast. And it's um, some people, it's a, a bit far fetched, but people think that it's part of the reason of the white disease of, uh, of a coral reef. So I, I cannot elaborate more on that because it's not my area. I only know what I have read. Thanks, Eduardo. Uh, another one are these, wetlands are these wetlands associated with the aquifer, meaning the groundwater that flows into fracture feeding? The aquifer. When does the when does the water flow from south to north? All right. Yes. Um, well, actually, these wetlands are both recharge zone and discharge zone. So, water goes into the aquifer some time of the year, and when the water table elevates, it is um, a discharge area. So it's in both directions. The wetland is feeding the aquifer and the aquifer is providing the, the water for the, for, the, for the wetland. We cannot um, distinguish one from the other, basically. Now, when the water does the, uh, flow from south to north, I cannot respond that accurately, uh, but based on the, um, the water table elevation and the difference in elevation all across the fracture zone, it will be all year round. Only in, in events, in, in north events, when there's very high speed wind coming from the north, uh, basically in our winter, November, January, November, December, January, in February, uh, there's a time when probably tides um, refrain the, the water flow so south to north, but in a very short part of the coastal system. Uh, inland, water flows all year. Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks. Uh, meanwhile, we receive more open more questions to take advantage of the minutes that we still have. I, I, I will I will ask you uh, perhaps some advice or thoughts, even thoughts about policy and water management. Uh, how seasonal wetlands behave within a year? I mean, my, my, my fundamental question will be how to manage groundwater, uh, particularly uh, for the Yucatan Peninsula, in the Yucatan Peninsula, you know, in the context of water management in Mexico, because it is provided at annual scale. So I, I would like to, you know, listen to your thoughts about it. Yes. Well, I, I have, well, I, I would, I will spoke in first person, but um, some of the, the, the comments is shared among a large group of, of, 
uh, colleagues. Uh, and as you mentioned, there are thoughts and probably they're disconnected, but I, I, I'll, I'll try to connect at least three of them at the end. Well, first of all, we have a regulation that is uh, completely with a central view. And by central view, I mean developed, created, and uh, conceived from the highlands in Mexico, basically Mexico City. So those laws and regulations cannot be applied to this area. They has to be adapted. They have to be adapted because the conditions we have are different. So we're giving uh, steps towards that direction, uh, but the rules and the regulation are completely based on a, on a highland perspective. Then second, the, the water balance and the water budgets. They have to be reassessed. Uh, probably the, the, the yearly basis is adequate, but we have to adjust that every year uh, in terms of the water, uh, the precipitation we have, which has been changed, probably not in amount, but the distribution, the regional distribution. And so, so far, the water budget that has been uh, created and updated for the, the Yucatan Peninsula is based on several assumptions that some of them are completely, they cannot sustain themselves. And um, some of the water budget balance, the, the balances and the budget they assumes uh, a static aquifer, which is not true. And some of the natural uh, discharges are not completely well assessed or estimated. So we have to provide better numbers to them. And um, we can use several approaches and, and from, from, what, from what we can do and we did, uh, we have done, we have provided some evidence uh, based on the um, hydrogeology and, and stable water and water stabilized groups. And the third one will be that at a, at a local scale, you have to work with the people that manage uh, the water, um, who provides the water at a local or a regional scale. Some wells that are for water producing for the general population are well instrumented and they know how the water table oscillates, but other others, particularly in the rural area, they don't. They just rely on local knowledge and when water is needed, starting the pump and turning off the pump, and that's it. And probably that's a, a, an opportunity area that we can provide information to the government or the appropriate, the, the adequate agencies uh, so that we can have all the information relative, for example, at least water table and water conductivity. So we can know, we can know how thick or, or fresh water lens is, when to stop, where we can have more um, extraction zones and where we have absolutely to establish recharge areas. Thanks, Eduardo. <clears throat> There's one comment from Stacy Springs. Uh, it's not a question, but uh, she just wanted to thank to SWS and, and to you, Eduardo, for offering this resource. And, uh, and yeah. Um, I'm glad, thank you. Thank you, thanks for listening. And also thanks for the SWS. Uh, okay. Well, I think it's time to move on. Thanks, Eduardo, again. Uh, before leaving, I just want to uh, say that we are proud to recognize our SWS Webinar Series sponsors for 2022 for this year. Winterton Group, WildNote, Delta, Land Services, and in situ. You can find their information at the websites, at the websites listed above. Uh, please visit, like, and follow our SWS webinar sponsors. Uh, our next webinar will be on August 18th at 1 p.m. this time, and we will join. We will be joined by Kongso W. Edit for a presentation on urban wetland management in Cameroon. Check out our website and social media channels to learn more and register for upcoming events. And don't forget to complete the survey that will be sent to you after this webinar to receive a certificate of participation and provide feedback of this webinar series. 
Thanks again to today's presenter, Eduardo, and our audience for presenting today, for participating today. Having a wonderful day and stay well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.